Ever felt the sharp sting of betrayal slicing through your heart? I lived it. My world, once filled with love and trust, crumbled when the person I cherished most chose deception. Why, Lucy? I remember asking, the pain evident in my voice. It's not what you think, she lied, her eyes dodging mine, while whispers of her infidelity echoed. Yes, so much better, she moaned to another. The truth, cruel and unyielding, shattered our illusion of love, leaving me to navigate a path littered with deceit. This is my journey through heartbreak and revelation. Enjoy watching it. You made me look dumb. Those bad dreams gotta stop. Hey, lady, you're sad. Cause you've got nobody else to use. I pressed the button on the radio to change it to some late night show talking about Bigfoot or UFOs. I was sick of hearing that same song over and over in the last few hours. Why, you might ask? Easy. It reminded me too much of the woman I left. Wait, I didn't just walk away, I ran. Let's start at the beginning. My name's Stan Shipman. For the past five years, I was married to Lucy, who used to be Lucy Dalton. We were a thing in high school, and I thought we'd be together forever. We got married straight after high school. Yeah, a bad move, I know. But we were so in love, or so we thought. Boy, was I wrong. Money wasn't a problem. I'm a welder. I've been doing it since I was a kid. My dad was a welder, taught me all I needed. I've been joining metal since I was big enough to safely use a welder. I always wanted to help my dad at work, but couldn't. Rules and insurance said no. But my dad made stuff at home, and he always had something for me to do. It was a good way to learn, and I liked it. After high school, I went to a welding school but got bored because I knew everything they taught. So I tested out and impressed everyone. I got my certificate and started working right away because I had a lot of experience. I could do lots of things, plus welding. I got paid well, especially when I had to go out of state for big jobs. I even did welding underwater and made a bunch of money. I made enough to pay for Lucy's college, and now she's a paralegal at a fancy law firm. So why am I running? And why am I on the freeway late at night? It's because of the person I married and her mean friend. Yeah, Lucy was all sweet and nice when we were young, but things change, and they did. Don't get me wrong, I love her, and I was happy to pay for her college. Her folks thought I'd be broke doing it. They didn't think I could. Big time. They were just as proud of me as they were of her the day she got her diploma. Even better, she got through school owing no money thanks to me. What things? When did things go bad? After she got a job at the law firm McMaster and Fredericks. The first months were fine, but then things got bad bit by bit. Some of the women she worked with weren't good for her. Lucy started going out with them for girls' night once a week, usually on Wednesdays. At first I didn't mind, since she got back early enough for us to have some time together, and I was often out working hard. But then she started going out on Wednesdays and Fridays. What made me mad was that Fridays were our date night. When I talked to Lucy about it, she said, we can just go out on Saturdays. I need this time with friends. Then she began to stay out later and later. It got to where she wasn't home until early Saturday morning. If I tried to call her to check if she was okay, it always went to voicemail. I finally had enough and sat her down to talk. We need to talk, I said one Saturday morning over coffee. About what? she asked. These Friday night outs of yours, I said. Fridays were our date nights. But now you're out until nearly 4 a.m. What's going on? I hardly see you. The girls and I just like to relax with some drinks, she said. And sometimes we dance, that's all. I know, but those clubs close by 1 a.m., I said. Why are you out so much later? Are you with someone else? Of course not, she said, sounding tired. If you must know, sometimes we eat after. Yes, but until 4 a.m., I asked. Sometimes, said Lucy. This has to stop, I said. You need to choose. You're either my wife or their friend. They see you more than I do. I didn't mind one night out, but this is too much. I'm sorry, she said. If you want, I'll stop going out on Fridays. I think that's best, I said. Then we can have some time together. She agreed and went to shower. I took her phone and put a tracker app on it, feeling bad but needing to know she was safe. Things were fine for a few weeks, but then Lucy slipped back into her old ways, going out on Wednesdays and Fridays again. I had to know what was up, so I used my phone's tracker and saw where she was after work on Friday. I got ready and went to the club where she and her pals were hanging out. 
It was more of a bar with music and space to dance than a real club. Right when I walked in, I saw her sitting with about four girls and three guys. Lucy was really close to one guy. Too close, if you ask me. She was also dressed way more eye-catching than in the morning. They didn't see me coming until I was at their table. Everyone but Lucy looked up and the guy by her asked, What do you want? Like he was tough. Just got off work, wanted a beer, I said, making Lucy notice me. Everyone was quiet. Not going to intro me to your friends? Lucy looked around, clearly worried. Everyone, this is Stan, he's my husband, she said. Hi, everyone, I said, not too kindly. I noticed her rings were missing. Forget something? I saw her hand. I took my rings off so I wouldn't lose them, she said. Didn't seem true to me, but I let it be. I see, I replied. Her friend stood, trying to look big. He shook my hand, said, I'm Jake, Jake Rollins. Lucy and me work close, with a smirk. The others laughed a bit, not Lucy. He tried to show he was the strong type with his grip, but he couldn't. So I showed him my strength until he looked hurt, then stopped. Was about to ask your wife to dance, okay? He said, holding his hand. I looked at Lucy. Okay? She nodded. Go on, just remember she's my wife and I'm here, I told him. He nodded and Lucy stood up. I took Jake's seat, ordered a beer. The rest had mostly gone off. You don't own her, you know, said the girl by me as I waited. And you are? I asked. Marie. She mentioned Marie Compton. I've been mentoring Lucy a little bit, showing her the ropes. So, Marie. Marie Compton? I remarked, mocking the way she and Jake introduced themselves. Who are you that I should seek marriage advice from? I am Lucy's friend, and as I previously stated, I am mentoring her. She said, taking a sip from her drink. The partners enjoy her work and have big hopes for her. I didn't like her arrogant demeanor and wondered what type of nonsense she was giving Lucy. So, Marie, I never said I owned Lucy, but I am her spouse. If there is anything going on that is interfering with our marriage, I want to hear about it. The reality is, Stan, Lucy needs to broaden her horizons, Marie suggested. She's only ever known college. And you? She needs to expand her wings and extend her horizons, I asked. Is there anything else she needs to spread? Perhaps her legs? There's no need to be crude, Marie explained. But now that you mention it, maybe she needs to try new things. Of course, you will benefit in the long run. How? I asked. Maybe she'll learn something and bring it home to you, Marie replied with a smile. After all, you're definitely earning some extra money when you travel for work, aren't you? No, Marie. I don't. I claimed I was going to work. I busted my buttocks. I put in work hours, get paid, and then return home. I adore Lucy, and I would never do anything to injure her or jeopardize our marriage. Perhaps you need to extend your horizons, she replied with a smirk. I said, I take my wedding vows very seriously, and I trust Lucy to do the same. I do not notice any rings on your finger. Have you ever married? She stated that this had happened a few times. Let me guess. Did your husbands catch you cheating on them? I asked. She shrugged his shoulders. Yeah so nobody owns me. I do whatever I want with whomever I choose. Well, Lucy is taken, and I expect you to respect that, I said. She chuckled. She answered, yeah, keep thinking that. Jake and Lucy had already returned from the dance floor. I moved up to allow Lucy to sit between me and Marie. I sat down, blocking Jake from sitting beside her. He didn't seem happy, but I didn't give a shit. So Lucy tells me you are a welder. What are welders making these days? Fifteen dollars per hour. Actually, working underwater earns me more than $35 per hour. Didn't Lucy tell you that I financed her way through college? Are you paying her student loan? Then he asked. No, she has no college loans because I covered her expenses. I also purchased the new Toyota for her. Damn, I had no idea welders made that much. I'm in the wrong business. When you travel, I'm sure you meet a lot of women, he inquired, prodding me with his elbow. No, I work when I am out of town. When I'm on a job site, I usually work for six hours per day. As I told Marie, I take my wedding vows extremely seriously. I am sure you do, Jake replied smugly. I didn't like the way things were going and these folks were starting to irritate me off. I turned to my wife. Have you driven here tonight? I asked her. Yes, she said. Good, since I've had about as much fun as I can handle tonight. I'm going home. I expect to see you close behind me. When I went to stand up, I accidentally knocked my nearly full ice-cold drink into Jake's lap.
smearing the crotch of his khaki trousers. Oops, sorry for that. I guess you better go home and change your clothes. He jumped up, furious, and appeared to be about to swing. You better make it count, pal, or your dick will be in the dirt when I wake up. He noticed the expression in my eyes and backed down. That was a smart move, I told him. I turned back to my wife. Are you coming? I am right behind you. She spoke quietly. Marie gave me a look, which I noticed. If looks could kill, I would most likely be dead by now. I walked out the door without looking behind me. Lucy pulled into the driveway a few minutes after me. Good for her, I thought. I took a beer from the fridge and waited for her in the living room. She stormed in her face, red. What the hell was that about? You made me feel extremely ashamed. Have I embarrassed you? I asked rhetorically. Are you following me or something? She asked. I shake my head. No, I was genuinely looking to get a beer, and I was astonished to see you there with your work friends. I said, recognizing that I had just lied to her for the first time in our relationship. If anyone should be embarrassed, it was me. Imagine what ran through my mind when I saw my wife. The love of my life and greatest friend in the world were sitting there with some sex hound acting like a thrilled schoolgirl. Imagine how I felt when I noticed you had taken off your wedding band. You were embarrassed to disclose that you were married to me. Is this it? Her face softened, and she sat down beside me. Of course not. It's just that I need to work with these guys. Jake is the attorney with whom I work the most, and what is Marie's role? She is higher up on the food chain than I am. She's been coaching me and showing me the ropes. Does this include marriage advice? I asked her. What do you mean? She asked. So as you and Jake were dancing, she was lecturing me all about how you should extend your horizons and stretch your wings. I inquired if that meant spreading your legs as well, and she almost confessed you did. And we're moving forward. Be honest with me. Did you cheat on me? No, I have not, she replied, looking down. For some reason, she couldn't look me in the eyes. Was she lying to me? I hope not, because that is the one thing I can never forgive, I told her. Marie has said that you may receive some while you are away. R. We've known each other. What? Since sixth grade. Have you ever seen me be unfaithful to you? Ever. She shakes her head. No, she replied gently. I have never cheated on you and never intend to. I love you too much to insult and hurt you in that way. Besides, when I'm away, I'm too busy working. I was not kidding when I told Jake. I often work 16 hours per day, I understand. I have seen your pay stubs. Here you go. What are your thoughts? Put you through college. But you, that new automobile out there kept you dressed nicely all the time. That's on top of paying our regular bills. You know, I've been saving up for a good down payment on a house so you can tell Marie to shove her garbage up her ass and shut the heck up about stuff she doesn't understand. You didn't care much for her, right? Lucy inquired. Not at all. I don't like the BS she's been feeding you. The same goes with Jake. I do not trust either of them. She's been divorced twice because she cheated. Lucy glanced at me in disbelief. How do you know this? She asked. She told me. He seemed really pleased of it, too. I have a feeling the two of them are up to something, and they plan to bring you down with them. You haven't done anything wrong, right? No, Stan, I have not. It is just exactly what I asked her. I enjoy going out with them, she told me. I enjoy going out with you as well. Think you could start spending more time with your husband? Of course, she stated this while wrapping her arms over my neck. I apologize, that is okay. You know, I've only ever wanted three things in life. What is that? She asked first. To get married to you. The second goal is to be the best welder around. The third option is to have a family. She grinned as she snuggled closer to me. Well, you convinced the first to work on the third. It was my turn to smile. Let's go, I said. We dashed into the master bedroom and spent the rest of the night making love. Things seemed to settle down for a few months. Lucy stayed home on Fridays, so I made an extra effort to be more attentive and affectionate. I intentionally avoided mentioning Marie or Jake again, trusting Lucy to do the right thing. Then something happened. When I arrived home one Friday night, the house was dark, save for a few lit candles on the dining room table. I could smell the Xenia in the kitchen and assumed Lucy had something special prepared. I entered the dining room and noticed she had our best china placed on the table. I turned around and saw her. My wonderful wife was wearing one of the shortest outfits I'd ever seen. I like looking at her legs, and she knew it. So she chose a dress that highlighted her greatest features, 
The front of the dress consisted of two panels that barely covered her large cup breasts. The dress had no back. She approached me and threw her arms around me, giving me a deep tongue kiss. Tonight was already looking nice. Do you like what you're seeing? She asked. I nodded my head. Yeah, I said, admiring her beautiful form. I'm delighted tonight is going to be so amazing. Why is that? I asked. It is a surprise. Go get washed up and take a seat while I get dinner. I walked into the master bedroom to clean up and change out of my work clothes. By the time I had washed up and returned to the dining room, Lucy had served the lasagna and even provided Portis with a glass of wine. I adored Lucy's food, particularly her lasagna, which was usually oozing with cheese and stuffed with meat and mushrooms. I'm not sure which is more tempting, you or the lasagna, I murmured as I sat down. She giggled as she sat down. I hope you enjoy both tonight, she replied with a smile. I dived into my lasagna, which was wonderful as always. I took a few sips of my wine, not wanting to get too intoxicated for the upcoming sex. After finishing everything, I felt a little odd. I tried to rise up, but I was too dizzy. I almost fell down. I stared at Lucy, puzzled. What did she do? I asked myself. I attempted to speak, but found it quite difficult. Why? I began. But before I knew it, I was tumbling to the floor. When I finally woke up, I found myself naked on a chair in our bedroom. My arms were zip-tied to the chair's arms, as did my legs. There was a device around my waist, and my tool was stuck within a strange-looking tube. What the hell was this? I asked myself. Lucy, I was so pissed off and yelled. I shouted, what the hell is going on? A few moments later, Lucy entered the bedroom, but she was not alone. Marie was with her. What kind of BS is this? I asked. Get me out of this chair immediately. I'm sorry, darling. Marie said it was finest. Best for what? I demanded. So you can witness your wife develop her horizons, Marie said calmly in her legs. Was it your idea to drug me and bind me to this chair? I asked. Of course. Lucy assured me you'd never go along willingly. So I gave her something to put you out for a while. This way you can watch your wife, KQ, and there won't be a thing you can do to stop it. I gazed at Lucy madder than I had ever been in my life. And you went along with the stuff. You know what this means. I'm truly sorry, but Marie insisted it was the only way. Trust me, please. This won't affect us at all. It's only sex. I still love you. Marie claimed that most married men fantasize about this kind of stuff, whereas I don't and never have. And sure, it does affect us. I told you I wouldn't stand for any cheating. And what the hell is this contraption you placed on me? I asked her. It's called a meat cage. It's supposed to give me ultimate power over you and let you know who's in charge of our marriage. I swear to God I have never dreamt about this. And I assure you that if you don't release me from this chair and remove this thing off me right now, we are finished. Please don't be that way. It's just one night. I'll let you loose when we're finished. I shake my head. You're not this foolish Lucy coming loose right now. Marie walked over to me with something in her hand. The next thing I knew, she had put some type of a ball in my mouth that prohibited me from speaking. You need to be silent and allow your wife get screwed by a real man or two. I shook my head to attempt to keep her from putting the gag in my mouth, but wasn't successful. I attempted everything I could to break out of the chair, but wasn't able to. Marie stood up and headed to the entrance of the bedroom. Jake and another man from her office came into the room and looked at me, chuckling. Well, well, the cook is ready for his initiation. Yes, but he's not being too cooperative. Really? This might help. He reared back and smacked me across the face with his hand. Then he hit me again. I could taste blood in my mouth. I was seeing red by now. Lucy yelled, don't hurt him. You promised me not to injure him. I owe him for destroying my clothes. Now he'll watch me screw his wife. With that, he reached up and ripped Lucy's dress off. He told her to get those panties off. I shake my head. But Lucy lowered her panties and handed them to Jake, who sniffed the crotch before throwing them at me. As I watched Lucy get on her knees in front of Jake and start giving him a BJ while staring me in the eye, I trembled with wrath. Jake and Marie giggled when they noticed my pain. Is your wife excellent at this? Jake stated. Soon, Jake exploded in Lucy's mouth, and as I watched, she looked into Marie's camera and grinned. Something about the manner she did that indicated that wasn't the first time she had done it with him. Lucy wasn't finished, however, and began giving the other man a BJI thought I'd get nauseous watching her. You like watching your wife with other men, don't you? 
Marie asked as she videotaped the event. Admit it, she said. I shook my head and gazed daggers at her. After Lucy finished the second man, Jake took her to the bed. It's time for the main attraction, he remarked, staring at me as I watched Jake starting having sex with her. I closed my eyes as Lucy may do it, she said. Any time, Jake hissed as he shoved inside her. God, it feels so amazing, Lucy said. Better than your husband, he asked. Yes, so much better, Lucy said. His tears streamed down my cheeks. At that moment, whatever love I had for Lucy was gone. I've read stories where husbands got hard, watching their wives get pounded. But all I felt was anger. I tried to keep my eyes off of them, tried to focus on anything else. But it was hard. By now, Jake was doing Lucy for all he was worth. All three trade places over the next hour. The three of them had a fantastic time doing all they could as Marie recorded the whole affair. After Jake completed within her for the second time, they got off the bed and walked over to me. Did you enjoy the show, honey? All of them laughed. That wasn't so horrible, was it? Marie stated. Jake and the other man pulled Marie and Lucy out of the way. Make sure you get this, Jake said to Marie. The next thing I knew, the two men peed on me, making sure to smear my face with their piss. I thought I'd throw up. Lucy laughed as they spat at me. Jake approached me when they were finished. If you say or do anything, Cook, I vow I'll make your life miserable, he said. Your wife now belongs to me. I'll come over whenever I want and do whatever I like. You've got me. He rose up and motioned for the other man. Come on, let us go, he urged. After they went, Marie approached me. Don't think about causing any difficulties. Jake was not kidding. This was child's play compared to what we could do to you, right? She stood and gazed at Lucy. Wait until I am gone. Then let him go. If he gives you shit, call me. After Marie went, Lucy nodded in understanding. Lucy removed the gag out of my mouth and cut the straps that held me to the chair. Then she grabbed the key to a nightstand and lifted the cage off of me. She began to say something, but I interrupted her, put on my clothes, and went to the phone. What are you doing now? She asked as I dialed 911. I may be a welder, but I am not stupid. I knew what she and her colleagues were doing was unlawful, and I planned to see them in jail that night. Lucy freaked out when she learned I had just phoned the cops to report a sexual assault and illegal detention. I seized Lucy's phone to prevent her from calling Marie. I also pulled her keys out of her purse to prevent her from driving away. She tried to steal her phone and keys from me, but I managed to keep them in my jeans pocket. When I hung up the phone, I sat down and waited for the cops. I knew they'd want to examine me and collect samples of bodily fluid for proof. Please do not press charges. I do not want to go to jail. Trust me. After what you've done, that's the most secure place for you right now. If I could have it my way, you would never go to jail. Hell, I would have made sure you prayed for the Grim Reaper, but I wouldn't let you go. Unfortunately, I do not want to go to jail myself. So you might as well get dressed. The cops will arrive any minute. You listen to what Jake and Marie stated. They mean it. You do not want to mess with them. Get dressed. I told her Lucy noticed the look on my face and knew not to push me. She gently put on her clothing and I felt her phone vibrate in my pocket. I took it out and noticed Marie had sent a text. Is everything okay? Marie's text was read. Everything is fine, I wrote. He isn't happy, but he'll cope with it. I sent the message, thinking Marie would fall for the ruse. I slipped the phone back into my pocket. By the time Lucy entered the front room, the police had arrived. I opened the door and let them in. It only took one look at my face to see that things were not going well. One of the cops took my statement, while the other officer spoke with Lucy in the bedroom. The officer collecting my statement requested an ambulance and collected samples of the substance on my face, placing them in evidence bags. The second officer returned, and they talked for a few minutes outside the front door before heading back. When they did, the second cop entered the bedroom and exited with Lucy. Her arms were behind her back as she cried. Please do not let them arrest me. It was meant to be just for fun. I shook my head, turning away from her. By then, two more police cars and an ambulance had arrived. A female cop arrived at the door and seized Lucy. The officer who collected my statement informed me that she was under arrest for illegal detention, drugging, and sexual assault. We'd like to get you checked out at the hospital. To identify what they dosed you with, we will require blood and urine samples. 
I considered debating but decided not to. The more evidence against the a-holes who committed this, the better. He also advised me to take out a protection order. He handed me a card with the name and phone number of an attorney from the local DA's office. I took the liberty of calling her already. And she said she would see you at the hospital, he told me. I thanked him and followed the paramedics who performed a brief checkup on the way to the hospital. When I arrived at the emergency department, they inspected me, took samples of the substance on my face, cleaned me up, and collected blood and urine samples. They gave me some painkillers, and I was just starting to relax when a well-dressed woman entered the exam room. Stan Shipman? she asked. I nodded my head. That is me. I said, Mr. Shipman, I am Linda Calloway. I'm the assistant district attorney, assigned to your case. How do you feel? I've been doing better. I am feeling exhausted right now. They gave me medication to relieve my pain, Mr. Shipman. The cops who brought you in informed me on the circumstances. I've also been advised that the other woman and the two guys who attacked you have been apprehended and are currently being held in county jail pending their hearing. I am requesting that they be remanded without bail. However, they will most likely be freed on their own recognizance. The corporation they work for wields considerable power in the county. I am afraid so. I've taken it upon myself to get a protective order for you. Thank you for that. Do you think it will help? She shrugged his shoulders. I cannot say for certain. Maybe, but there is no certainty. I nodded my head. I understand. I said, if it's any comfort, they'll be locked up until their arraignment hearing on Monday morning. After that, I understand it. I'm simply an ordinary working class stiff with no connections in high places. When push comes to shove, I'm on my own. You have me, Mr. Shipman, she remarked with a sharp tone. So long as you don't make any dumb decisions. However, unless you intend to remain married to your wife, you might consider hiring a divorce attorney. No, I am done with her. I said. She nodded, indicating her comprehension. I've been told that they intend to hold you overnight for observation. It's just as well because your residence is now a crime scene. It will take them a bit to sift through everything and gather the evidence. Do you have a gun, by the way? I shake my head. No, I do not. I told her that my younger brother had accidentally shot himself in the leg with my father's 0.22 millimeter pistol. He got rid of all his guns, and I felt it was best not to have any. Okay. Just so you know, we have castle laws in this state, so you can defend yourself in your own home. I will keep that in mind. I said, what about drugs? Are there any drugs in your apartment? I shook my head again. I do not. However, it appears that I cannot say the same for my wife. I said, okay, I'll send that along, she replied. After she went, I fell asleep and awoke when they rolled me into a private room after getting me settled. They gave me more medication and I went asleep for the night. My parents arrived the next morning after I had completed breakfast. They sat silently while I told them everything that had transpired. My father was furious when I finished. What are you planning to do, son? He asked. I informed him I was divorcing the witch. He nodded his head in agreement. Good for you. Is there something we can do? I could use the name of a decent divorce lawyer, I explained. I know quite a few folks. Allow me to see what I can come up with. I could also use a ride home after I'm discharged, I said. Not an issue. Just phone me when you are ready. In the meantime, you can rest and relax. Do not do something silly. You recognize me. I said, yes, I do. He replied with a smile. That's why I said don't do anything stupid. We everyone laughed, and they left after my mother hugged me. Lucy's parents arrived shortly thereafter. We had always gotten along, and they were like second parents to me. I explained what happened the night before. They were both surprised and mortified by what their daughter had done. I assume you're going to file for divorce, her father remarked. I nodded. Yeah, I cannot live with what she has done. I completely understand, and I genuinely apologize. Is there anything we could do? Her mother inquired. If Lucy is released from jail, she will need a place to stay. The assistant district attorney. She is getting a protection order. Therefore, she will be unable to stay in the apartment. Her mother agreed she may come and stay with us. Thanks. I informed her. We said our goodbyes, and they went. A couple of hours later, the doctor came by and examined me. He judged me fit for release, and the nurses started their paperwork. I knew it would take a while, so I called my father and informed him. My parents returned around the time the paperwork was completed. 
After the nurse gave me my instructions, she pushed me in a wheelchair to the loading zone where my father's car was parked. They assisted me into the vehicle, and we were on our way. We eventually arrived in front of the apartment. My father accompanied me to the door where we said our final goodbyes. Remember, if you require anything, please call. Thank you, Dad. I spoke. I entered the apartment and had a look around. The police had gone through everything, and I knew it would take some time to put everything back. I saw immediately that there was a message on our answering machine. I played the message, Dead Meat. The message contained nothing else. There was no introduction. Nothing. I searched and discovered that the number was marked as private. Something in the message appeared familiar, so I listened to it several more times. It dawned on me. This was not someone talking straight into the phone. I recognized the phrase as a line from one of those old Rocky movies, notably the one starring Mr. T. Whoever sent the message had taped it and then played it back over the phone a few minutes later. The doorbell chimed. I peeked through the peephole and saw a young, gorgeous brunette standing outside. I recall seeing her at the club when I first met Jake. I looked around but saw no one else with her. I had an idea and took my cell phone from my shirt pocket. I turned on the camera, set it to record, and put it back in my pocket. Then I opened the door but left the chain attached. Yes, I inquired. Mr. Shipman, may I ask? She inquired quietly. That's me. And you are Holly Brinkman. I work with your spouse. May I enter, please? Are you by yourself? I inquired. Sure I am. I closed the door enough to detach the chain before reopening it to let her in. After she entered, I shut and locked the door. Miss Brinkman, what can I do for you? I inquired. She said, please call me Holly. That's okay. Holly strikes again. So what can I do for you? She gave me a manila envelope. What's this? I inquired. Please open it. She replied quietly. I opened the folder and peered inside. I noticed a couple of images, so I placed the envelope on the coffee table and excused myself to go to the kitchen, where I grabbed a pair of latex gloves. I didn't want a chance getting my fingerprints on something. I returned and brought out the images, stunned by what I saw. The images displayed a horrific image of a deceased man on his knees, his hands bound behind him. The other photo showed the same man, but from a different perspective. I looked across at Holly. Who's this? I inquired. It was my husband, she added, tears streaming down her face. His given name was Brian. Did you report it? I questioned her. She nodded. Yeah. The police declared it a suicide. How? I inquired. You don't comprehend. The firm for which we work has acquaintances in both high and low positions. They own a large portion of the police force and some judges are on their payroll. I see. Jake, did you do this? She simply shrugged his shoulders. I honestly don't know. He could have ordered it. So why are you still working for the firm? I questioned her. I have no choice, she said. Let me make a guess. You're more than just a legal secretary, are I correct? That is right. They treated us the same way Jake and Marie treated you. Except that my husband went after Jake and paid the ultimate price. So are you truly just a hooker for the firm? I inquired. She nodded. Yes. My job is to be available to the attorneys and their clients. What is Marie's role in all of this? I inquired. She reminds me of the madam. She manages all of our assignments and she was adding Lucy to her stable. I questioned her. Yes, she answered. I looked inside the envelope and noticed something else. I picked out a folded piece of paper and opened it. It was a note, but the letters appeared to have been taken from magazines and newspapers and stuck to the paper. Talk about cheesiness. I nearly laughed out loud, but I resisted the impulse to stand Shipman. The note started, Please back off, or this might be you, it reads. I looked across at Holly. Have you read it? I questioned her. She shook her head. No. It was dropped off at my apartment this morning with a note to hand deliver to this location. Would you be willing to discuss this with the district attorney? I inquired. She shook her head. No. If it is okay with you, I would prefer to continue living. You don't realize how nasty these folks are, particularly Marie. How many people in your company are aware of all this? I inquired. Almost everyone over the mid-level executive level, she claimed. I nodded. Figures. Okay, Holly, thanks for bringing this to my attention. I am sorry about everything. You appear to be a terrific man. Lucy is fortunate to have you. Thank you for mentioning that, Holly. Have a nice day, I continued, opening the door for her. I kept an eye on her as she walked away, 
making that no one else was nearby. I closed and locked the door. This, together with the voicemail, had a significant impact. I still wanted to divorce Lucy, but these threats took things to a whole new level. And believe me, Lucy would be praying to the Grim Reaper to take her when I leave with Jack. I terminated the video and contacted Linda. Fortunately, she had scribbled her personal cell phone number on the back of her card. This is Linda Calloway, she replied. When she answered, I told her about the message and the letter that had just arrived. This fundamentally alters everything. That's okay. I'd like you to bring this to me right now. She gave me her address and then hung up. At that point, I realized I needed to get the hell out of Dodge for a while. I gathered enough supplies to last a few days and placed it in the back seat of my F-150. I had another idea and reached for the meat cage Lucy had used on me the night before. That, too, was loaded into the vehicle. I had an idea and wanted to investigate it further. After loading some of my basic welding supplies into my truck, I called my boss to let him know what was going on and requested some time off, which he readily granted. He said, the job is done, and you have a lot of vacation time coming up, so take whatever time you need to get this done. Thanks, boss. I double-checked everything, shut the door, and exited. I arrived at Linda's condo in less than 30 minutes. She was astonished when she saw the photographs in the note. I also have a video of my conversation with the woman who brought it. It's really eye-opening. Please let me view it. I got out my phone and showed her the footage. Oh, God. She gasped as the video came to an end. This clarifies a lot. Can you provide me with a copy of that? I gave her the phone so she could do what she needed to do. When she was done, she returned the phone. Then I noticed Lucy's phone was still in my pocket. I took it out and handed it to her. What's this? Linda inquired. This is Lucy's phone. I put it in my pocket the night Jake attacked me. I completely forgot about it until now. Perhaps you will find something there. I'll ask our lads to look. She sat back in her chair. On second thought, perhaps I should contact the state or the federal government about this. If Holly's claims are accurate, I can't even trust our own police department. She glanced up at me before proceeding. What will you do? I'm heading out of town for a while. I spoke. She nodded. So what about protective custody? Maybe we should put you in a witness protection program, she suggested. Yeah, right. So Jake and his mates will know exactly where I am. No, thank you. That's okay. Just tell me where you are. Okay. Okay, I said. I set out without knowing where I was heading. I knew I needed to go away from this garbage for a time. I pulled into a bank and took out as much cash as I could before driving around again, keeping an eye out for any automobiles that might be following me. All I could think of was the photographs of the poor man who was slain because he refused to be sucked by Jake and Marie. I knew if I wasn't careful it would be me. It was late at night when it hit me. I pulled into a rest station and made a call. I hoped it wasn't too late. Fortunately, it wasn't. Yeah, said the gruff voice on the other end of the phone. Dave, my name is Stan. I spoke. Dave was an old acquaintance from long ago. We'd worked together on a number of projects and got along well. Stan, you old piece of shit. What the hell is going on, dude? I have a minor issue and was wondering if I might return with you for a few days. I answered, sure. Buddy, come on up. Just do me a favor and grab a couple. Six packs, please. No worries, pal. We'll see you in a few hours. See you, he added before hanging up the phone. Are you feeling better? I got onto the freeway and drove north. On my trip north, I came across a convenience store and stopped to get a couple of six packs of beer, a styrofoam chest, and some ice to keep it cool. I also warmed up my coffee and grabbed a couple packs of cigarettes. I didn't usually smoke around the apartment, but I knew Dave did and thought he'd appreciate the gesture. After all, he was letting me rack out at his apartment for a time, so I assumed I owed him that much. Dave Rowland was 15 years older than me and had previously worked with my father. That was how we met. He stayed with us several times while working in our region, and he felt like a big brother to me. While working at my father's shop, I learned a lot from him. He had it tough growing up. His father worked in shipyards and died of complications from mesothelioma. He was regularly exposed to asbestos till his father passed away. His baby sister Beverly stayed at home to care for their mother until she died from stomach cancer about a year ago. I'd known Bev for a long time. She was a no-nonsense girl who was gorgeous and resembled the girl next door. 
Of course, I never made a move on her, partly because of Dave's closeness with both me and my father, but largely because I was already in love with Lucy. Bev and I got along great, and we were more like siblings than anything. They're teasing each other about this and that. I hadn't seen her in a while and was curious to see how she was today. Dave, like myself, married young but got divorced when he returned home to find his wife with one of her co-workers. He has never remarried, but he does occasionally go out. The majority of his time is spent looking after Beverly, who now lives with him. Beverly, of course, would claim to be looking out for him. I pulled up in front of Dave's two-story log house around 2.30 a.m., got my belongings and the icebox, and greeted Dave on the porch. I hope you have some beer in there for us, he said that with a smile. After accepting the pack of cigarettes I provided him, he opened the door and assisted me in moving the rest of my belongings inside. As I brought the ice chest into the kitchen, I noticed a stunning blonde walking down the stairs, dressed in a large t-shirt and short pajamas. Who is this blonde bombshell? I questioned Dave. He gave a laugh. You recognize who I am, numbnuts? The blonde said. I took a second look and realized it was Beverly. She didn't resemble the gangly teen girl I remembered. Her legs seemed well-toned, her breasts had grown somewhat larger, and her hair had nearly reached the middle of her back. Beverly, I inquired, confused. Is it truly you? You already know what it is, dipshit, she said cynically. Why are you arriving so early in the morning? Lucy discovered you cheating on her and kicked you out or something? No, not quite. I spoke in a sharp tone. Her best face softened as she drew me close. Stan, I apologize, she replied, staring at my injured face. What exactly happened? Are you all right? Not exactly. That is why I'm here. Why don't you get a beer and come explain to us? Dave spoke. I nodded, grabbed three drinks, and went into the front room. I handed one to Dave and then turned to face Beverly. Are you certain you're old enough to drink? I asked, cynically. She laughed as she raised a middle finger and took a beer from my hands. Please spill it. What's up with you two? It's quite embarrassing, I remarked. So we're adults and we're really close to family. So get it done. Okay. I said before telling them the entire narrative of Lucy, Marie, and Jake. I showed them the video I recorded of my brief meeting with Holly. When I finished, they sat in stunned silence. Dave remarked, Damn, after taking a sip of his beer. Do you suppose they know where you are? I don't believe so. I saw no cars. Anyway, follow me here. Fortunately, we are on this hill and can see anyone heading up here and I still have the pistols I purchased from your father after Mikey's accident. Do you still remember how to shoot? I just nodded, my own head. Yeah, but I haven't touched a gun since then. I spoke. My younger brother, Michael, or Mikey as everyone knew him, inadvertently shot himself in the leg with my father's point-and-shoot pistol years ago. Mikey merely sustained a small flesh wound and made a full recovery but my father felt so awful about it that he got rid of all his guns and never bought them again. That's okay. I'll take you all back and let you become acquainted with them. This can also apply to you. She's developed into a capable shooter. I looked at Beverly, shocked. She sat up and smiled wickedly. Does your father realize you're up here? They've asked me. I shook my head. I haven't told anyone where I am. However, I need to inform the assistant DA you must remember. I didn't think of coming up here until I was already gone. Okay, I'll phone your folks and notify them this morning after the sun rises. If possible, avoid using your cell phone. In fact, you should turn off your phone and remove the battery just in case there is a tracker on it. This is a good idea, I said, turning off my phone. I took the back off and removed the battery. So Lucy and her companions are appearing before the judge on Monday? Beverly inquired. Yes, the arraignment is scheduled for Monday. The DA is hoping that the judge holds them without bail, but after hearing what Holly said, I'm not sure that will happen. You're welcome to stay for as long as you need. I have a job to start a week from Monday, and I will be gone for a week. But if you need to stay, that's cool. How much time are you going to take off? I had planned for two weeks. I hope this is resolved by then. As previously said, you are free to leave. Dave spoke. Thanks. That is something I really appreciate. Please let me know if there is anything I can do to help. Dave gave Beverly a smile. I'm sure Beth has a few ideas, but you're a guest here, and your parents have always treated us like royalty. So you may relax and take in the fresh country air, so far as I am concerned. Well, gentlemen, this has been fun, but I have to get up and make breakfast in a few hours, Beverly stated, standing up. 
I hope you enjoy omelets and hash browns because that is what I am preparing, she added, glancing at me. Breakfast for champions. Sounds good to me. She waved before heading upstairs. Dave and I went out back to smoke cigarettes and talk when I heard her bedroom door close. What's the story with her anyway? I inquired. I assumed she'd be married and have children by now. She never met anyone. She genuinely cared. She dated a couple men, but she said they didn't measure up. What are you measuring up to? I inquired. He gazed at me with seriousness. Do you have numb nuts? She has always had a huge crush on you. There is no way, I said, astonished. Absolutely. The only reason she didn't tell you was Lucy. She did not want to be the reason you two split up. Are you really serious? He described it as a heart attack. Why do you believe she still likes me? I inquired. I've heard her cry out your name more than once. That's a little too much information, I said. Dave smiled and took a sip from his beer. So it is what it is. So Beverly, when did you transform into a babe? I have always been a beautiful girl. She never flaunted it. Besides, you had only eyes for Lucy, right? Yeah, I do. Look, I'd be fine with you two getting together. Just do me a favor, please. What's that? Please don't shatter her heart. I adore my sister, and I believe you do too. If you think about it, I really don't want her to get her hopes up. Then watch you and Lucy reunite. That would ruin her. I shook my head. I'm finished with Lucy. That's okay. Well, I should go to bed. We'll see you later this morning. He got up and ground out his cigarette in the can. He had said everything and went upstairs. When there was a bet, I finished my cigarette. I fell asleep the moment my head hit the pillow just a few minutes later. I awoke later when Beverly opened the door and called at me to get up, shine, and wipe the sleep from my eyes. And I noted the time was 830. I walked into the bathroom to do my morning routine, then took a fast shower, dressed, and headed downstairs. As I dressed, I looked at the ring on my finger and removed it, tossing it on the dresser. When I came downstairs, I noticed Beverly in the kitchen, preparing breakfast. Her outfit consisted of a short t-shirt and cut-off shorts. Her long hair was pulled back into a ponytail, and her blonde bangs fell across her brow. She was a vision of loveliness, and I wondered why I hadn't seen it before. That smells nice, I spoke. She gave a smile. I'm delighted you think so, cowboy. If you want some coffee, it is already made. You still enjoy butter pecan creamer? Yes, I do. Did you get any? Yeah, inside the refrigerator. Please help yourself. Just keep some for Dave and myself. I made a cup of coffee and added creamer. Southern butter pecan is one of my favorite flavors. Dave got hooked on marijuana after my father brought some on to a job site. She smiled and said, go ahead and have a seat. I'll get it finished in a minute. I took a seat at the table where Dave was already sitting, reading the Sunday paper. Morning, I said. He examined me over the paper. Morning, he responded. Is there anything intriguing happening in the news? Yeah, a story in the paper about a fancy lawyer being arrested for a variety of offenses. Take a look, he said, handing me the article. The story made no mention of individuals and provided few specifics. It was mostly boilerplate news that no one would understand. I did not know the complete story. I grunted and returned the paper. They had finished cooking breakfast and were bringing it to the table on a trolley. This is very excellent. I spoke as I took a large bite. Beverly smiled as she said, Thank you, sir. I'm pleased you agree. We completed breakfast and Dave rose up after cleaning his plate. I need to go into town and get some items. I will be gone for at least a couple of hours. If you need to contact the DA, you can use your home phone. Thank you, I replied. Beverly handed him a list of what she required and he tucked it in his pocket. He grabbed his keys and walked out. I looked across at Beverly. Do you need some assistance with the dishes? I inquired. I don't necessarily need it, but it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for your question. I got up and assisted her in clearing the table. She tossed me a towel and started doing the dishes. Everything is already in the sink. I noticed you're not wearing your ring. Will you actually divorce her? Yeah. I told her I would not tolerate infidelity and I meant it. Good, she replied with a small smile. I am delighted to see you still have some balls. What's the story? How are things going with you? She simply shrugged his shoulders. Okay, I guess. Is there somebody special in your life now? I inquired. There was once, but he had already been taken. 
Furthermore, I would not have been able to pursue a relationship anyway. I'm too busy taking care of my folks. That was what I heard. Yeah, that had to be done following Dad's death. Mom required my assistance. To supplement my income, I worked as a waiter. She only had Dad's 401k and some social security. I worked till she was too unwell to do anything. Then I stayed at home and cared for her full time. Sorry to hear that. Don't be. I have no regrets about remaining home with her. I only hope that when I'm her age, someone will be around to help me. So, what occurred? I inquired. There was little left after Mom's death. We had to sell the house and a lot of her belongings. We were able to pay off all of her final costs with the remainder of Dad's pension and 401k. There was a little left over and Dave let me have it because I took care of her. He promised Mom that he'd let me stay with him. And this is where I have been ever since Dave offered to pay for my college education. But I refused him. Why, I inquired. I do not want to be obligated to anyone. I want to make it on my own, if I am able to. So I stay here and work at the local McDonald's. I earn enough to afford my expenditures and am taking a couple business classes at night. Good on you, I said. Yeah, Dave has this notion to start his own fabrication firm, and he discussed having me do the accounting and such, she added. He's still talking about it. Yeah, he does a lot of one-of-a-kind stuff for people around here. Custom barbecue grills, trailers, and other such items. It pays rather well. His dream is to stay at home and operate from his backyard shop. Perhaps he'll show it to you while you are here. It would be nice. We were silent, and I discovered myself admiring her for the first time. I noticed how stunning she truly was, and not just from the exterior. She gave me a glance before speaking. What exactly are you looking at? She inquired. I believe I'm looking at the most stunning woman I've ever met. I told her I believed I saw its form in her eye. Stop teasing me, she replied gently, looking down. I am not. I cannot help but admire you. You have put your own life on wait for your parents. You declined Dave's offer to send you through college. And you're making your own way through school. I'm sorry I didn't notice it sooner. Well, Lucy blinded you, so I can't really hold it against you, she explained. Yeah, I suppose you're correct. After washing all of the dishes, she drained the water in the sink, dried her hands, and turned to me. She was used to you, you know, Beth explained. I guess you're correct. Of course I am right. I saw it three years ago. Why didn't you say anything, I asked. You would not have believed me. I recognized she was probably correct. In your opinion, she could not possibly do anything wrong. She had you wrapped around her little finger, and you would have done anything for her. All I wanted was to keep her happy, and look where that led you. She received her degree, a new automobile, and a plethora of jewels, trinkets, and outfits all on your dime. Then, when she no longer needed you, she traded you in for a new model. I'm delighted she is in jail because if she were here right now, I'd tear her a new hole. I think you would. I only want to know one thing. She spoke, her hands on her hips. What is that? I asked. Will you fall for her tears and take her back? She asked. I shake my head. No, I replied. That ship departed after Friday. That is not going to happen. Good, she replied. And if you have a second, remember this. She removed her T-shirt and dropped it on the floor presenting herself to me for the first time. She stripped, walked up to me, and wrapped her arms around me, giving me the deepest tongue kiss I'd ever had. We made love. I love you. Stan Shipman, I have always adored you. Never forget that. I will be your woman for as long as you want me. Beverly, I adore you too. I want to stay like way for the rest of my life. That sounds wonderful, but I don't believe my brother will appreciate it, she joked. I chuckled and kissed her hard. Then it struck me. I stared at her with concern. I just remembered I hadn't used any protection. Do not worry about it. I'm on a medication. Besides, I wouldn't mind if you made me pregnant. I would love to have your children. I will hold you to that. We'd better get cleaned up before Dave returns. I need to lay out the meat for tonight. Why don't you get up and take a quick shower? Okay, I'll be up in a moment. Okay, what's with the meat? We enjoy barbecuing on Sundays. Weather permitting. You enjoy venison, don't you? Yeah, I enjoy venison, but it's been years since I got a nice shoot at it with Dave's. Fifty caliber flintlock. I even dressed it in the field using my own two hands. My. You were quite a gal, the rugged outdoors. A kind. I'm really amazed. 
I'd seen Dave's flintlock and knew it needed to be at least 49 inches long. Did you load it yourself? I asked her. Of course. Patched round ball containing 100 grains of double left powder. Even more than the bullet itself. Damn. Do you enjoy fishing as well? She smiled. I like to go fishing. I even bait my own hooks and clean the fish. Is there anything you haven't completed? I asked cynically. I have not yet rebuilt Dave's truck's transmission. I did, however, assist him rebuild his engine. I'm definitely in love. I told her and kissed her. She kissed me back. Now hurry, run upstairs for a quick shower. I'll be up in a moment. I went up and jumped into the shower. A few minutes later, Beverly joined me. Just wait until nighttime when we go to bed. By the way, you'll be sleeping with me from now on. My bed is much bigger than the one in your room. Won't Dave be upset? I asked. Nope. Besides, we are both consenting adults. After our shower, we dressed and returned downstairs. I need to contact the DA and let her know where I am. I said, Jeff pointed to a wireless phone resting in its cradle. Go ahead and use the phone. I took up the phone and called, almost forgetting it was long distance. Linda answered the phone after the second ring. Linda Calloway, she mentioned. Linda, this is Stan Shipman. I simply called to let you know where I am. Stan, thank goodness you phoned. I was starting to worry. I see you're phoning long distance. Where are you now? I am with a longtime family friend. I turned off my cell phone to be safe. Okay, I will keep you updated as much as possible. I've already heard from the feds. It appears that they are investigating into the firm. Your wife works for someone. By the way, I took the liberty of speaking with an old buddy of mine who happens to be the best darn divorce lawyer in town. I hope you do not mind. No, I do not. Good. She expects to hear from you tomorrow. I told her a little about your circumstances. She is capable of dealing with this situation. Thanks, I will do that. Linda gave me the information I needed and promised to let me know how the arraignment went before we concluded the call. Dave had returned by this point, so I walked out to assist him in carrying his belongings on. By the way, he stated, when we finished, I called your parents. They were quite concerned about you. I informed them that you were staying with us for a time. Thanks. That night, we barbecued the meat and ate dinner on their balcony. After supper, we all joined in to clean up. Dave and I got a beer and went outside for a smoke while Beverly finished up. Bev, tell me you'll be sleeping in her room, Dave stated. Is this going to be a permanent situation? I was a little uneasy discussing this with him. She was his sister, after all. I believe so. What do you think? Yes, it is. I just need to finalize my divorce. Do you love her? He asked. Yes, I do. Good. It's about time you get your head out of your buttocks, he said with a smile. Look, there is a big female who can make her own judgments. She can certainly take care of herself. I just don't want her to be wounded, that is all. I never harmed her. I am delighted to hear that. Welcome to the family, he said, offering his hand. I accepted it, and we exchanged warm handshakes. Please don't keep me up all night, okay? I laughed and nodded my head. I will do my best. That night, when Bev and I made love in her bed, I hugged her close to me and imagined our future together. I felt more content than I have in a long time. What are you thinking about? She inquired quietly. What about the future? She asked. Yeah. I mean, what do you want from life? Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? I know it's common for women today to desire to burst through the glass ceiling and reach for the brass rings, she explained. But I am not like that. I am not seeking for a job or anything like that. All I want is a devoted husband who loves me as much as I love him, and a family to care for. That is all. How about your courses? That is primarily for Dave's benefit. When he gets his business started, he's going to require help. How about you? What do you desire from life? I guess I am a lot like you. All I want is a devoted wife who loves me as much as I adore her. In addition, I have my own family. I believed I had it with Lucy, but it did not work out. How about your job? she asked. I enjoy what I do for a living. However, it can take me away for a few weeks at a time. Can you handle that? She laughed. Please. My brother is a welder, just as you recall. I understand what to expect. I can deal with it as long as I know you'll come home to me. I glanced at her for a few moments before speaking. I wish I'd met you before meeting Lucy, I added. I agree. But whatever is done is done. We'll make it through this together, okay? We're a team and we can accomplish anything as long as we're together. I will always be here for you, no matter what. I love you so much, 
I replied, kissing her. I love you more. She stated this while wrapping her arm around me. I fell asleep, feeling truly loved for the first time in years. The next day, Beverly awoke before the rest of us. After breakfast, she dashed upstairs to prepare for work. She kissed me on her way out, telling me she had classes the night after her shift. I generally get home by 930, so you'll have to fend for yourselves. Remember, regardless of what occurs, I love you, and I am here for you. I adore you too, I replied, reciprocating her kiss. She had no idea how much it meant to hear herself say that. What? Don't I receive a kiss too? He added, smiling. Beverly chuckled and gave him a sisterly kiss on the cheek. You too. Try to avoid trouble, okay? She asked as she left. I need to contact the divorce lawyer, Linda advised, I said, gazing at the clock. They had motioned to the phone, so I took it up and dialed. The law firm of Bernice Goodwin said a friendly female voice on the other line. I introduced myself and asked Bernice if she was available, notifying the receptionist that she was expecting my call. Sir, Miss Goodwin is expecting your call, the woman spoke. Just a moment, please. I heard some Muzak on the phone for a few moments before another woman answered Bernice Goodwin. The woman spoke. How can I help you? This is Stan Shipman. Linda Calloway gave me your number and told me to call you this morning. Oh, certainly, Mr. Shipman. Linda informed me part of what's going on, and I've been waiting for your call. Normally, I prefer to meet in person, but I understand that this is not possible this time around. That is okay. Today, we can do most of this online. Please give me your complete story. I spent some time explaining the situation, and she patiently listened. What are your expectations? She asked when I was finished. I want as much as possible. No alimony, but at least my portion of our assets. I believe we can do it. Your wife's criminal charges should support your case. I'll need to see your financials, though. Do you own any properties? A house? Anything like that? No. We reside in an apartment, I explained. What about taking action against Marie? Jake? Alienation of affection suits are legal in the state, but I have to tell you they rarely go very far. You should probably sue for deliberate infliction of emotional distress. Do whatever you believe is right. I replied, all right, I will take a closer look at this and get things started. Have you have an email address? Yes, I do. Good. I will send you some documents. One of these is a contract. I'll need you to electronically sign and return. The other is a checklist of tasks to complete. Please take care of that for me. I will also require you to pay a retainer. Can you do this today? Yes. Good. I'll get the items sent to you. And when everything is ready, I'll have the paper served, she stated. Are there any questions so far? There are no questions. I gave her my email address before she passed me to her assistant, who grabbed my payment card information before I hung up the phone. I turned on my laptop and checked my email. Sure enough, Bernice had sent an email with two attachments. I opened the contract electronically, signed it, and sent it back with a receipt to ensure that she received it. There was also a booklet outlining how I could protect myself financially. Thank God for online banking. I expected it would take a while, but I was able to open a new account for myself, transfer half of our money, and check into it. I paid off and canceled Lucy's credit card, but I kept mine open because I had recently paid my retainer on it. It was early afternoon by the time I finished everything. So Dave took me to the shop, where he was working on a trailer for a local farmer. I worked with him for a while and found it a soothing way to keep myself busy. We received a call at three o'clock that afternoon. Dave answered the phone through the extension in his shop and handed me the receiver. He said, that's your lawyer. This is Stan. I spoke after taking the receiver. Hello, Stan. This is Linda Calloway. This is bad news. The judge granted all of them the shortest allowable bail and released them. How is this possible? I asked. He is undoubtedly on their payroll. Fortunately, the protective order is in effect. But I'm afraid that's only as good as the paper it's written on. It's best to stay put. Don't come to town. The feds are keeping an eye on them for now, but I cannot guarantee your safety. Terrific. I said. So what should we do now? You stay where you are. I'll do everything I can from here. Call me if you require anything, okay? Yeah. Okay. I said. We concluded the connection, and I handed Dave the receiver back. Bad news? He asked. Yeah, the judge let them go. Crap. I should phone your family and let them know. That sounds like an excellent concept. I should probably be the one who tells them. Dave nodded his head and returned the receiver to me. 
I called the number and my father answered on the second ring. Dad, this is Stan, I said. How are you, son? He asked. I am doing okay. I simply wanted to let you know that the judge set Lucy and her companions free. Be on the lookout. Something tells me they may pay you a visit to find out where I am. Do not worry, son. We will not tell them anything. Are you still down at John Harrison's place? The inquiry shocked me because I already knew where I was. My father and I had previously worked for a retired foreman named John Harrison. After retirement, he and his wife relocated to a location about two hours south of town. Then it struck me. Lucy and her buddies are undoubtedly looking for me right now. I decided to go along with the ruse. Actually, I'm at a motel approximately 50 miles south of there, I told him. Okay, as long as you're okay, I'm fine. I'll leave here in the morning, though. I plan to travel east. Please let me know where you are. Okay, son, he asked. Yes, sure. Can I speak to mom? She's currently occupied in the bathroom, my father said. I listened closely and believed I heard noises in the distance. Okay, tell her I'm okay. And I love her. I will, son. My father remarked I could sense the strain in his voice and hoped for his safety. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, will do. Dad, love you. I love you too, son, he replied before the phone ended. I looked at Dave and made another call. What's up, Stan? Linda said as she answered her phone. I believe Lucy and her friends are at my parents' place, I told her. Okay, I'll get a couple of federal agents and head over there right now. Stay put. We concluded the call and I handed Dave the phone back. What's happening? He asked. I believe Lucy and her friends are at my parents' house trying to figure out where I am. I replied, Yes, I heard what you told your father. Do you think they will buy the house? I hope so. For at least a couple hours. I knew we only had around six to eight hours if they proceeded south to John's residence. Maybe I should go out and find somewhere to hide until this blows over. No, we're in it together. You stay put. Let me get cleaned up before heading into town to speak with the sheriff. Do not go anyplace. Do you hear me? I nodded my head. A few hours later, he left the house and went into town. Linda called back after he left. Stan. You were correct, Lucy. Marie. Jake and some of their thugs went there after the hearing. They restrained and threatened your family members. They claimed they did not expose your whereabouts. We have an APB out for them right now. They left one of their guns here, and he is currently in arrest. Of course he's not talking. Do you know where they're going? I asked. No, I do not. But I don't believe they bought your story here. Talk with your father. A few seconds later, my father was on the phone. Stan, I do not believe they bought the ruse, he added. Are you all okay? I asked. Yeah, we're fine now. But I believe Lucy and her companions are on their way to you, he explained. What makes you believe that? I overheard Lucy speaking. Okay. Let Linda know so she can call the sheriff. Will do, son. Take care here. I will. Dad, I told you the next voice on the phone was Linda's. Where exactly are you? I told her where I was and provided directions. Do you believe Lucy knows where that is? She knows. All right. You stay put. We will have someone out there as soon as possible. We got into the car, and I went back to the house. As I exited the shop, I heard a familiar voice. It was Jake. Oh, well, did you think you could outsmart us? Nice try. Telling your family you were heading south when you were actually traveling north. Fortunately for us, Lucy knew where you were going. Now move, he said, swinging his weapon at me. Get in, he replied, motioning to a black SUV. When I got to the back, I noticed Lucy smirking at me. We thought you could outsmart us. Did you? She asked, smirking. This is not going to go well for you, Lucy. Whatever happens, the cops will arrive soon. It will be too late for you. You should have just followed along with the program. Now you're going to pay the price. Marie and Jake chuckled at that. Jake directed the goon to drive down to a location along the creek bed at the bottom of the hill. When we arrived... Jake opened my door and motioned for me to come out with his gun. So you intended to murder me, is this it? I asked Lucy. She laughed. You know what they say? She stated that dead men tell no tales. Jake and Marie chuckled as the goon zip-tied my arms behind my back. When he finished, he forced me to my knees. First things first. I've always wanted to have sex in the wide outdoors. How about that, Lucy? Are you ready to give up your soon-to-be deceased husband? One final show something to send him out with. What the hell, she remarked, removing her clothes. Come here and do me, baby. Jake snickered as he pulled his pants down. 
Just think, Stan, while your corpses rot in the creek. Jake will be doing me every day. I'm going to enjoy wasting your money and portraying the heartbroken widow. She extended her legs, and Jake began doing her the goo and keeping me down while snickering. Enjoy it, he whispered. It will be the last thing you see. I looked away and refused to see Lucy and Jake run like animals on the ground. Personally, I hoped the two of them would get devoured by chiggers. It would serve them well. I told you Lucy was extending her horizons, Marie remarked. You may as well enjoy the performance. It will be the last time you ever see your wife. After around a half hour, Jake was finished after catching his breath. He stood up and pulled his trousers back on. I looked at Lucy. Why? I asked her. Why did you do this? She shrugged his shoulders. What shall I say? She inquired rhetorically. He's wealthier than you, and he's bigger than you. Besides, I don't want to marry a welder for the rest of my life. I want a good life and Jake can provide it. Are you two done reminiscing? Jake asked. We have business to attend to and it is becoming late. Emotion towards the thug who pushed me to bend forward. Jake, meantime, went to the SUV and returned with a large blade. I am sure you know what will happen next, old friend. Do not worry. I've been told that death is almost instantaneous. You will not feel anything. Now make peace with God. A hole. I closed my eyes and silently prayed. I saw Jake's shadow and realized he had raised the sword above his head. Then I overheard it. A rifle shot. As I watched, Jake's body collapsed to the ground. There's a bullet wound on his forehead. His eyes remained open, but I knew he had died. Another shot rang out and the gun fell as well. Blood is flowing from his chest. Marie attempted to take Jake's gun, but another shot rang out and she collapsed, screaming, having been injured in the shoulder. Lucy looked around, afraid, and attempted to hide behind Jake. I heard the familiar sound of a four-wheeler in the background and knew it was approaching us. I attempted to see who it was, but all I saw was a cloud of dust as it approached. Then it was on us, and I noticed the long, blonde hair streaming behind the driver. Beverly was someone I knew. She came to a halt and jumped from the four-wheeler, holding a skull-hunting gun. She took a huge knife from her belt and cut the zip tie that was holding my hands together. When she was free, I sat up and watched her run up to Lucy. She struck Lucy across the face as hard as she could with the buttstock of her rifle, knocking her on her back. If you ever touch my man again, I swear to God, I'll blow your idiotic head off, Beverly yelled. Do you comprehend me? Which is what I stated. Do you comprehend what I'm saying? Which? Lucy nodded slowly. Beverly then dropped the buttocks on her kneecap like thunder. I heard a crack. Lucy shouted with pain. We heard sirens in the distance, so Beverly approached the four-wheeler and pulled out a flare gun. She pointed it toward the sky and shot a flare to alert the cops to her location. We spotted flashing lights heading our way. Are you all right, sweetie? She asked when she approached me. I am now. You've saved my life. I will never be able to repay you for this. Trust me, you'll have the rest of your life to make amends to me. She replied with a smile. We soon found ourselves encircled by police cars. Dave drove up in his pickup and got out to check on us. One of the deputies phoned for an ambulance and the coroner. Are you okay? They've asked when he approached us. I am now. Thank you to Bev. She saved my life. The sheriff took our statements and oversaw the remainder of the operation. By now, an ambulance had arrived and paramedics were caring for Marie and Lucy. She killed Jake and Ronnie. Marie yelled out, aren't you planning to arrest her? Nope. The sheriff stated, this is Dave's property and we have a castle doctrine here. Miss Brolin was completely within her rights to defend Mr. Shipman's life. Consider yourself lucky that she did not kill you as well. As I watched deputies handcuff Lucy and release her, the sheriff informed me that he would charge her and Marie with attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. We were released after the officers had gathered the evidence and removed the bodies. I rode Beverly's four-wheeler back to the house. I thought you had class today. What happened? Dave came to McDonald's and told me what had happened. So I clocked out and headed home. I had to make sure you were okay. I noticed tire tracks in the grass and followed them down to where you were. So I got into a deer stand that I had set up and you know the rest. When I saw what Jake was about to do, I just acted. I'll catch up on class. Don't fret. I'm not scared. I'm thankful. So much. I picked up the phone to tell Linda what went down. She was glad to know I was fine after all that. We've got them trapped now. Don't worry. The firm's gonna crash hard. I sure hope it does.
Then, I rang my folks to fill them in. They too were happy to hear we came out okay. That night, I couldn't thank Beverly enough for saving me. Marie got better from her hurts, and she and Lucy went to court for trying to kill and planning to kill. They were found guilty for what they did when they attacked me and kept me locked up. Both got life in jail and were hit with more charges for plotting and wrong business by the firm. I only saw them twice in all this time. Once when Bev and I had to speak in court and again when they got their punishment. Both times they looked awful, and I couldn't help but grin. The end of it was they would never be free again, and that made me very happy. Meanwhile, Beatrice got the divorce done quick, and because of Lucy's wrongs, got the judge to leave her with nothing. She also won a big money deal from Marie, and Jake's stuff. By the end, I was sitting on a pile of cash. Sure, Bernie got a piece, but I was more than pleased with what I got. The firm also paid a huge sum because the partners were fighting a lot of big charges, like criminal business work and being linked to the death of two men. When all was settled, the firm had to shut down and the partners ended up in jail for life. This all happened in about six months. When it was all wrapped up, I had plenty for Beverly and me for a long while. I got a pretty ring and asked her the big question properly one day. She yelled with joy and covered me in kisses. About a month later, we got hitched and spent a week in Las Vegas. Back home, we sat Dave down in the living room and pitched our idea. His eyes popped when we brought up starting DNS welding and custom work. For real? He asked. Yep, I said. Beverly showed him the business plan she made. After he checked it thoroughly, he leaned back. You know, this might just work. Oh, I forgot, he said, diving into his pocket. He pulled out keys and gave them to us. You seen that lot on the south side? Yeah. What about it? Seen that new home there? He asked. Yeah, we thought you sold that lot. Nope. That's your gift from me and your folks, he said, looking at me. It's all new with cool stuff. The lot and the home are yours. Oh, and your dad and I moved your things in, but left out anything with Lucy's face on it. Wow, I'm lost for words. Sure, I could go for a big fancy house, but this was good enough. Solid like a regular house. No way was I going to turn it down. I knew it was worth a lot, over $150,000. Just say thanks, buddy. He reached out his hand. I smiled and took it. We hugged tight. You'll be okay with us there? Beverly asked. I wouldn't want you lonely. I'll be fine, he said. Plus, I need some quiet sleep. Tired of hearing you two all night. We laughed at that, and I called my folks to thank them, too. That night, Beverly and I made the master bedroom ours. Yes, lying there, I knew things would go well. Having money means a lot of friends. And these friends have other friends, even those in jail. Lucy and Marie were not having fun in jail. They had to clean with their toothbrushes and do things for other inmates who liked them. Looks like Lucy and Marie's world just got bigger. Dear listeners, what do you think? Drop your thoughts below, and don't miss out on liking, sharing, and subscribing.